spend any time watching the news, and you're sure to see a spiritual truth in action. Welcome to Through the Bible. What can we learn from the news? Well, the same principle that we'll take away from our study in First Chronicles this week, and that is, we're at war. That's right. What's happening in flesh and blood is just a reflection of the spiritual battle that's raging in our souls. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will walk us through the battles that David found in First Chronicles chapters 18 and 19. And speaking of war, not all the news out of war-torn North Africa is bad. Here's an update from a brother from Algeria who listens to TTB in the Kabyle language. Now, Kabyle is spoken by the Berber people, and they live in nations that are 95 to 100 percent Muslim. And yet the gospel is reaching them through radio, and people are being introduced to a loving God, the only one who can save them. Here's the update. Hello, friends of God the Father. Let me tell you all that God has done great things in our country, Algeria, especially in Kabylia. Here's the good news. We did a survey among the official and unofficial churches in Kabylia during two months of travel. We recorded 300 men and women who asked to get baptized this summer out of obedience to following Jesus, their Savior. Hallelujah. The institutions in Algeria are very worried about the future of the religion in our country. They say it is seriously threatened by the Christians. My dear friends and friends of God, I tell you this to show you that your work is not in vain. The radio work is very effective because the message can arrive discreetly in the ear of each who listens. God bless you in the Lord as you continue to send us your programs. Now let's commit our time in God's word to the Lord. Father, thank you for the encouragement that your word always accomplishes the purposes for which you send it. And that's the case in Muslim countries, and that's true in our hearts here. May your will be done in both today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, today we come to this 18th chapter of First Chronicles. And we've come here again to another new section. And we have David's Wars, 18 through chapter 20. Now, somebody, I'm sure, is going to say at this point, You've been emphasizing that in First Chronicles and in Second Chronicles. We see God's viewpoint. How can wars be fitted into this? Well, let me make this preliminary statement. You see, why come wars? James, you know, in a very practical manner, he asks that question. And he not only asks it, but he gives the answer. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence? Even are your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. In other words, today the thing that has been the background of war has been the sinful heart of man. And that when sin came into the world, why, that was the problem. And it's the sin question, not the war problem. It's very easy to protest wars. And there have been a great deal of protesting wars. But you don't get rid of wars by protesting them. And you may bring a war to an end, one war, but another one's going to start because the problem is in the sinful heart of man. And you and I live in a world where the Lord Jesus said, A strong man arm keepeth his household. Why? Because they're enemy. You see, we're not living in an ideal situation today. The millennium has not come yet, and man can't produce it. Only the Prince of Peace will bring peace to this earth. And until then, while we'll do well to keep our powder dry, We'll do well to keep our atom bombs, by the way, because there are enemies in the world and there's hatred in the world. And the very interesting thing is that when man sinned, God said immediately to Satan, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, her seed and thy seed. Now, friends, you can't remove that. The Lord Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sower. And until... Sin is removed from this earth until wickedness is removed from this earth. There are going to be war. Wars are the symptom. The disease is sin, and that is the problem. Now, 
God faces up to it. David is becoming now a man that God has blessed. And as a result, there are enemies round about. As long as he was a little petty king, tribal king, why, they paid very little attention to him. But he's having problems. And God lets us know that he took note of the fact that even David's kingdom was in a world where there was war, and that you do well to keep locks on your house. I get rather amused and have been amused at people. They don't think that we should use chemical warfare over in a foreign country, but they feel like that the Molotov cocktail is all right in this country. At least they try to explain it away, say, we just don't understand how these people feel. May I say we do understand how these people feel? Sinners. That is the problem, and the problem is that. Now let's look at David's wars here. Chapter 18. Now after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab. And the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. And David smote Hadareza, king of Zobah, unto Hamath, as he went to establish his dominion by the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots. Now these are the spoils of war. And David also hewed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them a hundred chariots. Now, why did David get rid of the horses? Well, because God had told the king never to multiply horses or wives. Now, his son, later on, Solomon, multiplied both. I was at Megiddo in the Valley of Esdraelon, and the most prominent thing in the ruins of old Megiddo are the stables of Solomon. That's where he kept horses. In fact, you find these stables at Jerusalem, He had them all over the land, and Solomon went in that business, but David did not. David was zealous to obey God, but he's a hot-headed man, as we're going to see. And David made mistakes, and he's in a very real world. Now you find here, as you read this chapter, that he gets a great deal of the spoils of war, and these were used later on. I think that by the time that David had died, that Israel had pretty much accumulated the gold market. I think that the gold was there in Jerusalem in that day. Verse 7, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadarezim, brought them to Jerusalem. Likewise from Timnath and from Chun, cities of Hadarezim, brought David very much brass, wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass. You see, David accumulated all of this as the spoils of war. Now, verse 11, Them also King David dedicated unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he brought from all these nations, from Edom, from Moab, the children of Ammon, from the Philistines and from Amalek. Now, every one of these nations we know from the past were enemies of Israel, and they fought against them. Now, David is given the victory over all of these. And there comes to him the spoils of war, so that we see that this man, in order to become a king over that land, there are enemies to be driven out. Now, the child of God has enemies. We're told today to put on the whole armor of God. Now, our enemy today just doesn't happen to be a flesh and blood enemy. Our enemy today is a spiritual enemy. And that's the point Paul made. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is not our enemy. But there is a spiritual enemy. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, friends... This is the situation that you and I are in a world. Now, this idea today that the Christian can sit down and twiddle his thumb 
and you can compromise with everything that comes along, you're entirely wrong. You're going to have to stand for something. I tell you that today we need folk that will stand up and be counted. We've got a lot of folk doing what I heard a country preacher down in Georgia say some time ago. He says a lot of people, instead of standing on the promises, they're sitting on the premises. And I'm afraid that that is absolutely true. Today, we need to stand for something. Now, David is doing that. These are enemies. And these enemies, it must be overcome. Now we have an incident given that reveals to me that God does have a sense of humor. And yet it's a tragic thing. And it reveals that David is a pretty hot-headed man. He's very much of a human being, by the way. And here's an instance. God records that David may be very much at fault. But it's a very interesting incident in a way. And it reveals also the fact that David is a very big-hearted man. Now, let me begin reading chapter 19, verse 1. Now, it came to pass after this that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his stead. Now, Ammon was an enemy of Israel. Now, David didn't want to make war. David's on the defense, as we've seen most of the time, and most of his life he was. God's man will find himself on the defense. If you notice, when we're put on the armor of God today, what does it do? To march? No, to stand. We're to stand. That's the important thing. The tragedy of the hour is God's people won't stand. Now, David had these enemies, but David wanted to be a friend now of Ammon. And what happened when Nahash died and his son reigned in his stead? David said, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. If you go back in the history of David, you remember that when David crossed over, Ammon was kind to him. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. So the servants of David came into the land of the children of Ammon, the Hanan, to comfort him. Now notice what happened. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Are not his servants come unto thee for to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? Now you see, this is a pretty serious charge that these men, apparently young men, that are around the new king. They say, David is not your friend. He wasn't a friend of your father. And these are spies. Now, what did they do? Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved them. Now, that was a disgrace for a Jew. He was told never to trim his beard, you remember. And he shaved these, and he cut off their garments, in the midst, hard by their buttocks, and sent them away. And believe me, that's embarrassing, friend. You can imagine these fellows. That was not a day of nudism. And they were pretty embarrassed, you know, to make a public appearance. And so, actually, this was an insult. This is an insult you can't pass by. But David's a red-headed fellow. He's hot-headed. And notice, then there went certain and told David how the men were served. And he sent to meet them. These men, they wouldn't come back into the presence of David. They wouldn't come into Jerusalem. They are not only embarrassed, they're disgraced. And in their shame, they are not going to make a public appearance. And David knew that. And David went to see them. He sent to meet them. For the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. Go into retirement here. Stay here until your beards grow out again. And then, of course, you're going to have to get a new uniform. I want to tell you, they were disgraced. And they were disgraced. And when the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, you see, word got back. He said, you ought to hear what David said when you did this to his servant. Hanan and the children of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire them chariots and horsemen out of Mesopotamia, out of Syria, Maacon, out of Zobab. Now, you see, instead of David being the one who wanted to make war, 
This new king wanted to. He wanted to demonstrate that he could overthrow David. And so now, knowing that what he's done, and I'm confident he knew what the outcome would be, that he is disgraced. In fact, it's an insult to the nation of Israel and an insult to David, the thing that he's done. He knew that. And now he sends and hires an army from Syria to help Ammon to overcome David, you see. Well, when David heard of it, verse 8 now, when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty man. Here's an army that's gathering against him. And so David goes out to fight them. David's hot-headed, though, about all this. And the children of Ammon came out, put the battle in array before the gate of the city, and the kings that were come were by themselves in the field. But when Joab saw that the battle was set against him before and behind, he chose out of all the choice of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. Now, the Syrians had the best army. So he took the best of his forces and put them over against the Syria. And they're coming down from the north, and up from the south comes Ammon. And now the rest of the people he delivered under the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they set themselves in array against the children of Ammon. And his strategy was very good. He said, now, his brother, if you are overcome, I'll come to your aid. But if I'm overcome, you come to my aid, and we'll play it that way. In other words, they put their force against where the attack came. That was a strategy that was used by both sides in the Civil War. It was used at Chattanooga, there, which was the determining battle of the Civil War. And this was his strategy. Now he says, verse 13, Be of good courage, and let us behave ourselves valiantly for our people and for the cities of our God, and let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. So Joab and the people that were with him drew nigh before the Syrians unto the battle, and they fled before him. Now Joab was a real army man. He was a real soldier. And he had been trained under David. He and David were probably tops as far as military men were concerned. Now, when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, they likewise fled before Abishai, his brother, and they entered into the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. He came back to Jerusalem for report. When the Syrians saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they sent messengers and drew forth the Syrians that were beyond the river. In other words, they sent for help. Now, it was told David... And he gathered all Israel. He passed over Jordan. He came upon them and set the battle in array against them. So when David had put the battle in array against the Syrians, they fought with him. But the Syrians fled before Israel. David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots, 40,000 footmen, and killed Shophak, the captain of the host. And when the servants of Hadareza saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they made peace with David and became his servants. Neither would the Syrians help the children of Ammon any more. Now, may I say that David did not want to go to battle. And here's a tremendous lesson. Remember, you're getting God's viewpoint now. He didn't want to fight. God's making that clear. He wanted peace with Ammon. He made a gesture of peace. Now, he received an insult. He's a hot-headed man. And so he sees the enemies preparing to come against him. So David sends out Joab, and the enemy flees. But that doesn't end it. They are getting now help. They're getting allies on their side. So David now leads into battle. I tell you, when David led into battle, he went into battle to win, friend. I think it's tragedy for any nation, and that includes our nation, to fight a war not to win. How tragic that is. My friend, you don't fight wars just to fight war. You fight wars to get a victory. I think that's what General Douglas MacArthur said. That was the statement he made in the Korean War. And our nation has gotten itself into Tragic circumstances because of that. You see, if we'd have won the war, we'd have spared 
thousands of lives. Now, a great many people come along and read this and say, Oh, God is bloody. No, God's not bloody, friend. He knows the way to save human life. And the way to save human life is to win the battle, is to win the war. And we're in a sinful world. We're not living in a world where everything is a Sunday school picnic. It's a pretty brutal world. It's a mean old world that we're in. And any time that you want to say with Browning, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world, you're not quoting Scripture and you're not giving God's viewpoint. You're getting God's viewpoint here. And personally, I don't know about you, but I think it's tremendous. I think this is without doubt one of those great sections of the Word of God. This day of permissiveness, this day of the foul mouth, this day that we no longer have personal honesty and personal integrity and human sincerity, and we're told that our country is sick. Well, we have the greatest nation. The problem is individual. The problem is personal. We are permitting this awful permissiveness. We're in a world of sin. We're in a world where laws should be enforced and where criminals should be punished. Oh, it's not ideal. God didn't say it was ideal. God says, as long as you're in a world like this, a strong man armed will keep his house. And we're getting God's viewpoint here, by the way, which is quite interesting. Now we're going to see actually the greatest sin that David committed. And it hadn't anything in the world to do with Bathsheba. But next time, we're going to look at that greatest sin of David. And it's one of those things that people today say, well, I can't see why this is such a great sin of David. Everybody, for some reason, seems to think the matter of Bathsheba is a terrible sin. And I'm in that number. I agree it was a terrible sin. But my friend, we're going to look at the greatest sin of David. And that's the one that God recorded because it's on the spiritual level. And it won't affect David's salvation one whit. But it certainly is going to affect him and the nation Israel in their personal relationship with God. So we'll take that up next time. Well, I trust that you're not going to want to miss our study tomorrow as we turn to First Chronicles 20 and 21. And why not prepare your heart by reading ahead? I hope, too, that you're making the most of your study with Through the Bible by using Dr. McGee's notes and outlines. You can download them for any book of the Bible just by typing in your browser, ttb.org, followed by a forward slash, and then the name of the Bible book that you want to study, like ttb.org forward slash John or ttb.org forward slash Revelation. And then we also created a new resource around Dr. McGee's notes and outlines that I want to tell you about. It's called Briefing the Bible, and it's a compilation of all the notes and outlines. So instead of receiving them book by book, you can have them all in a single resource. So get your copy of Briefing the Bible in two free formats as a printed book or for free digital download. For either version, go to ttb.org forward slash briefing the Bible and follow the instructions to either download the digital briefing the Bible or fill out the form to request your copy of the paperback version to be mailed to you. You can also call 1-800-65-BIBLE to request your copy. And by the way, if I haven't said it lately, we'd love to hear from you. Your letters encourage so many people, our staff, our listening audience, and hopefully they even encourage you as you boast in what the Lord has done in your life through his word. We'd love to know how God has recently blessed you in your study of his word. Maybe you learned a new truth from our recent study in Romans, for example, or maybe you've been amazed about the richness of First Chronicles. Well, whatever the case, would you write and share your lesson? You can send your letter to Through the Bible, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Email BibleBus at ttb.org or visit the Through the Bible Facebook page. What was David's greatest sin? Well, you might be surprised by the answer that we'll discover tomorrow as the Bible Bus continues its five-year journey through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Be washed white as snow.
We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.